Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, welcome, and thank you for coming out to find out a little bit of, uh, about direct democracy. Uh, my name is Steve Clark. I'm the chair for Citizens for Direct Democracy. And Peter, John, and myself are three ordinary people who feel that we, the people, are being taken out of the decision-making process entirely. From as far back as the selling of the 407 to the selling off of Hydro One, a public asset, the concept of transparency and public consultation has been increasingly overlooked, most noticeably at the municipal level. Uh, Citizens for Direct Democracy is working to preserve the right for all the public to have a meaningful say in all the important decisions that take place in the Quartha Lakes in general and in your community in particular, but we need your help and we will explain why later. Now you may think that we are the only ones who are concerned, but let me read you a couple of recent letters to the editor. Okay, reader thinks Mayor is serving himself only to the editor. This letter is in reference to Mr. Collinson's letter, uh, City of Course the Lakes is a Mess. The cancellation of the Norman Festival and the propaganda called the Mayor's Message and closed with my recent tax bill. These three indicate a vast gap that exists between reality and the Mayor's self-serving outlook. The Mayor's talk of becoming leaner and smarter and right-sizing is nothing more than current jargon for slashing services and dramatically increasing taxes. This whole exercise costs well over a million dollars and growing, and has resulted in disenfranchised residents trying to cope with centralized government that is trying to satisfy the justifiable expectations of residents of an area the size of PEI. When community-minded citizens who have collected garbage strewn in the ditch and uh, declined a prepaid bag tag by the city and told, not to look, uh, told to look after themselves, it's no wonder alienation bred by big government exists. The mayor should not take pride in the way he has abused the taxpayers at the expense of his own unwillingness to do what is right. P.S. To say that never before has this area had such a clear picture of its financial position is an insult to all those who held an elected office in the past. That was by uh, F. Brett of Cobacock. And uh, reads questions the purpose of Mayor Lethem's recent town hall meeting. Uh, on Wednesday, July the 5th, I, along with approximately 100 other folks, attended what was advertised as a town hall meeting in Norland. My understanding of a town hall meeting is that it is an open public forum where attendees can present ideas, voice their opinion, and ask questions of elected officials. Most people in attendance came to the meeting without understanding also. Not so. The mayor had his own agenda and proceeded to give a presentation on the city and a proposed financial model. When someone in the audience shouted, we're not interested, the mayor suggested that if you're not interested, leave. Really diplomatic. While the mayor did allow some questions, uh, they were restricted to questions related to his presentation. Many people were upset and angry that they were not allowed to voice their concerns regarding issues important to this northern community. Several people came to the meeting to show concern for the cancellation of the Norman Festival, but were not given the opportunity. It was obvious that the mayor was only intent on doing what he wanted to do without regard for citizens' concerns. Political scientists would argue that the role of an elected official is to get re-elected. That being the case, the mayor failed miserably. So we're seeing some dissent amongst the, uh, the ranks out there. So tonight we have four speakers. We have Peter Weygang, who is uh, an Oxford graduate, a retired superintendent of schools, and who is also the secretary of Citizens for Direct Democracy. And he will give you a thumbnail of direct democracy and its history. Now, I will give a brief overview of the importance of the Bob Cage and secondary plans, the limitations and the lack of transparency during this or any other planning process. John Snyder, an operator of Snyder Auto, who is also our treasurer, will give an overview of the Main Street project and the lack of public input and the problems caused by that. And Bill Holmes, retired from GM, will give us an idea of the kind of figures we're looking at and the wastage involved, which directly connect, sorry, which is directly connected to your property taxes. Okay, so I would ask that you save your questions till afterwards, so all the presentations are done. Uh, write the questions down because you may forget them before we get there and uh, even written badly it will be just fine uh, and there will be a Q&A afterwards and we'll try and answer all the questions uh, that we can. So please let me introduce Peter Weygang for his presentation on direct Thank democracy. you Steve. Thank you Peter. Yeah. I, I remember being in introduced to when I was speaking in New Zealand and the pro company he said uh, I said, Peter Wayne. 
introduce yourself. I'm going to have a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, I want to cover three things in my talk. Uh, firstly, some background to direct democracy, what it is and um, where it came from. <clears throat> and then I give one example of what happens when people lose control of government. And I will end by explaining <clears throat> how the city really works. So we must start in Athens about two and a half thousand bees, uh, years ago, and the people were unhappy, heavily taxed, overregulated, just as we are today. They rebelled, they overthrew their tyrant, and set up democracy. Rule of the people, for the people, by the people. Now you've heard that before. Lincoln said the same thing in the Gettysburg Address. But it is the founding principle of any decent society. The people then gathered in the village square to discuss the plans for the community, such as where to put some irrigation channels, what wages to pay the workers in the olive groves, and what potholes to fix. There was much discussion before consensus was reached and approved by a show of hands. Note, they did not elect a leader nor a representative. They were fully involved themselves. The next stage was to choose the people to run the show for a year. These people were selected by lot. Their names were written on bits of pottery and put into a large earthenware jar. Then they pulled out names until they had enough people for the management team. Now the management team wasn't paid. It was their civic duty to carry out the plans, a duty that was taken very seriously. Now, these people only served for a year. In fact, that is all that was allowed. This made sure that power did not become concentrated in a few hands, which is what we see in modern democracy. The people were able to see how well the managers did their duty. Any managers who were slackers or started to follow their own agenda were removed. The Greek name for a piece of broken pottery is the same as our word for ostracize. So the bad managers were ostracized for 10 years. Now some governments have laws that permit a recall election, but I don't think the city does. Now we must be very careful in electing councillors. Their full commitment to the will of the people is absolutely essential. I don't think we have any councillors with that view at all. The population of Athens was about 60,000. Now that's not unlike the city of Quarth Lakes. It's a lot of people to go into the market square. So they solved this problem by splitting the population into 10 sections, each with 6,000 people. Now that is also very similar to the organization we had in Victoria County, a system that worked very well. Now direct democracy lasted for about 200 years. It even survived the defeat of Athens in the Peloponnesian War. Now, Athens came under the rule of Macedon. Now, that's another Greek state, and we all know it because that was where Alexander the Great came from. Now, when he died, the Athenians said, well, this is a good time to revolt. So they did, but they were crushed completely. In the new administrations in Athens, only the rich were allowed to vote. <clears throat> now, for me, the purpose of this history is to stop making mistakes over and over and over again. The situation in Athens and Macedonia back then was just like the problem now between Hong Kong and China. The outcome will be the same. If the people in Hong Kong continue to protest, then they will be crushed, and their style of government will end. The Chinese have just moved their largest aircraft carrier to Hong Kong, so they're not kidding. However, direct democracy was not completely dead. In 1848, the Swiss Federation was formed based on those principles. Now that's another history lesson for another time. However, we often hear about the political upheavals in the UK, in Germany, in France, and the United States. But all the while, the Swiss go on quietly managing their country in accordance with the wishes of the people. There are no upheavals, no nasty situations, Direct democracy really works. Now we live in an exciting time when, thanks to social media on the internet, we can once again discuss all the important issues. We don't even have to leave our homes to do so. 
We can reach a consensus or vote on the options. We can control how much our taxes will be and how they are spent. I find it outrageous that a group of people, the council, can pass laws that force us to give them money as much as they like. That must change. We all must live within our means. It's time for council to do the same. The plan to increase our debt by $40 million, which was announced in the Mayor's Town Hall meeting, is scary stuff. There's only one alternative to direct democracy, and it's tyranny. A tyranny comes in many forms, kings, dictators, religious oligarchies, party politics, ideologies like communism, councils, and the most dangerous of all, bureaucratic imperialism. All tyrannies have just two objectives. One, to gather wealth by taxation, and two, to keep us in that place by laws which they make. The city of Guadalajara Lakes is typical. <clears throat> now let me give just one example of what happens when people lose control of government. The city corporation, and we should call it that, has all kinds of information. It is stuff that should be open to public inquiry. We are paying for the salaries and benefits for everyone at City Hall. They are our employees. We should know what they're doing. Now, we've all heard the mayor use the word transparency, as if he knew what it meant. Last October, Steve opened a can of worms related to the Lean Six Sigma program. A newspaper report showed that it cost $400,000. That's almost half a million dollars to have the program, and we wanted some answers. This program is available online for $157. At that rate, <clears throat> that $400,000 would have trained 2,500 employees. In fact, 55 have been trained. Now, this program also has an overseer called a strategy and performance officer. They can choke on that one. Or master black belt, who has a salary and band benefits of 124,000 a year. So what is this program? It's a system for improving organizations by examining the process and product. It contains unusual subjects which you don't normally find in an office setting, such as hypothesis testing, lean manufacturing, lean manufacturing, lean product development, and lean healthcare. The question is, how do we, the taxpayers, benefit from this program? Now, in answer to uh, Steve's inquiry, Ron Taylor sent us information. He said that in 2014, this, pro this program saved us over $6 million. And in 2015, he said it was about $1.5 million. Now that, quite frankly, is Codswallop. How do you measure the cost savings of a bureaucracy, which we shall know is already less efficient than that we had before our amalgamation? Now, the tune keeps changing. On May the 4th, we read in the Quarter Lakes that Taylor said, savings definitely exist, but there are no hard numbers to prove this assertion, because savings are hard to quantify. Yet he had already calculated the savings of the Lean Six program to the nearest dollar. We have a huge contradiction that's not been questioned by council. It's now six months since we started asking questions about this program, simple questions, such as how much of an increase in salary is given to employers with these qualifications? Now, I spoke to the city clerk just two days ago. <clears throat> Apparently, there is no fixed amount assigned to these green and black belt qualifications, but it does play a part in the total evaluation process that determines salary. So we have to believe that 55 people took this course without expecting an increase in salary. They must be truly remarkable people. And yet there's another clause that says, if a person does move upwards, then the salary increase must be at least 5%. The lifetime value of a 5% increase for someone earning $50,000, including pensions, etc., is about $100,000 per person. So those 55 people 
are going to cost us about five million dollars. And that would pay them our taxes, not our taxes, our grandchildren's taxes. And do we get value for our money? That's the question that the council should ask before they approve these programs. Now the secrets of the city are protected by the Freedom of Information Officer. That person just happens to be one of our employees, the city clerk, has a salary of 118,000 a year. So we see that one of our employees is the gatekeeper for information about the corporation which we own. It's a blatant conflict of interest. Now it's important to realize that this situation cannot exist in a direct democracy. There are no secrets, no hidden agendas, because all the people are involved all the time. The decisions made by the people, there's nothing to hide. In fact, there's nothing to hide at all. It's like what happens in this room here, everybody knows. What was said by whom? Now, let us look at how the city really works. It's a corporation with a large bureaucracy. There is no bottom line, and that is the fundamental problem. We all know that in our personal life that the bottom line is the difference between survival and disaster, but not for the city, which has the power to assume debt, raise taxes, reduce services, and raise user fees. The city is getting fatter and fatter, but it has an elastic waistband. Many people think that council is in control of this bureaucratic corporation, but not so. In fact, the whole corporation has been put into the direct care of the CAO. This is not uncommon, but it's still the most astonishing situation. I'm going to read from, actually, something from the Gowata Lakes Halliburton Housing Corporation, where it defines the role of the CAO. It says, the board hereby allows the chief executive officer to use any reasonable interpretation of its policies and authorizes the chief executive officer to establish such further policies and procedures, take action and establish practices that support the policies of the board. This gives the CAO enormous personal power with no oversight on the public. And again we read, the board acting as a whole and the individual members of the board shall not shall not give instructions to staff who report directly or indirectly to the chief executive officer elicit or receive information concerning the management of the operation from the staff who report to the chief executive officer the board as a whole cannot ask any of the cao subordinates which basically means everybody, to give any opinion on how well the CAO and the corporation are doing. In order to do that, they have to pass a special resolution in council. That, that's absolutely staggering. The CAO has officially been given the power of the big, big brother. There's one more thing. We can no longer permit any bureaucracy that spends public money to be self-regulating, self-appraising, and self-rewarding. The whole of the core review is nonsense. No organization can review itself objectively. That is why the core review never considered cutting staff in order to cut costs. Yet that is the first thing that happens in the real world. The serious situation in Brampton was the result of just this practice. Senior staff paid each other a total of 1.25 million without the approval and in fact without the knowledge of council. No one was reviewing this process. The mayor, Linda Jeffrey, took a courageous step in hiring a new CAO who sacked, sacked 20 managers. She also noted that they needed to have an outside set of eyes looking into the matter. The police are now involved in that investigation. There is another scandal in the RCMP, which is another self-regulating bureaucracy. Apparently, the top man, the commissioner, has been investigated regarding nepotism. And just this week, we see another scandal brewing in Stouffville, and one more with the Toronto Parking Authority. This 
kind of thing seems commonplace in government bureaucracies. It can only be stopped by building society on an entirely different foundation, which is us. In a direct democracy, it is the people who review the employees. It is the people who scrutinise the balance sheet. It is the people who set the agenda. And this is where we want to get while we can. And that's why we're here tonight. It's the time to change all that stuff. It's the time to start the march towards real democracy, real accountability, real transparency, and real compliance to the will of the people. I would like to think that, in the future, people will remember Bob Cajun as the place where democracy was reborn and give us thanks, just as I do, for Athens. So that's the end of mine. Now, Steve is going to talk about planning and he's going to basically tell you if, if we're not in the planning, then the plan's going to be terrible. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Good. Uh, the Bobcation Secondary Plan, I'm going to bring this sort of really close to home now. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the Bobcation Secondary Plan and also integrate how unwell the city engaged the public at the same time. Uh, this tells how every project is handled and how transparency and the public are dealt with in such a way that yes, there was public consultation, but it's not meaningful consultation. <coughs> the Secondary Plan is a physical plan for Bobcation into the year 2030 where the official growth plan, which is a plan by the province to um, uh, put in growth estimates for different areas uh, that they see uh, are capable of, of growth. Uh, where they wanted Bob to grow to 13,000 residents in that time, which involves identifying all the services and the upgrades required to accommodate 13,000 people, all the development sites, all the green spaces, all the heritage sites, all the zoning, or recreation areas, floodplains, and the like. This is a very important document. And as Michael Benner, the head of the project at the time, said, that somebody, some manager for the city of Quarth Lakes in the future who hasn't sat at this table is going to try and interpret what we've done here today and implement it. Uh, the first public meeting was about 35 people showed up, and it was billed as a visioning exercise in the local newspaper. We were supposed to vision our way into 2030, which is a far cry from visioning a village adding 9,500 people in 15 years. The ads were placed in the newspaper 30 days prior to the meetings, and the meetings were spaced anywhere from three months to a year apart. This meant that people lost track and interest, and to add to the confusion, the meetings were all given different titles, uh, like Bob Cage and Visit, uh, Bob Cage and Visioning Meeting, Bob Cage and Secondary Plan Meeting, or Bob Cage and Walkabout. The second meeting I attended some six months later had approximately 10 people show up and the remainder of the meetings drew approximately 10 to 15 people per meeting. We'd found out by now that the secondary plan had already been drawn up by the city and there were actually three copies of this plan. Uh, the plan was draft approved by the council but was never amended. The other two were used for adjustments to, be, to make us feel that changes were going to be made. So you can imagine a surprise when we went to the council's secondary plan approval meeting and none of our changes were on the plan. But let me offer you a comparison. Uh, imagine you've just bought a custom home and the builder listens patiently to your changes but completely ignores them during the building process and gives you not the house that you want, but the house the builder wanted to build in the first place. Or how about going into a restaurant and ordering a steak dinner and getting a bowl of rice? And then the restaurant threatens to repossess your car if you don't pay for the steak dinner. Isn't this the same situation? We are, being, we are paying to be told what we're going to have for supper, like it or leave it. Moreover, we all know how we, we, we would respond to the builder or the restaurant, but I digress. We finally forced the city to allow an amending committee to be formed to address some of the problems with the plan. Now, there were several things about this situation that were exceptional. Firstly, we had in the group a planning consultant who had spent their entire working career uh, consulting municipalities on forming official and secondary plans for their community, the very plan that we were working on. Secondly, there were several others on the committee who were well read and able to understand legalese. And thirdly, we were visioning, sorry, videoing the committee meetings. So if you think this is all bunk and go onto my website, and all of this is laid out uh, in glorious technicolor, and you can see the hassle, and yeah, it was, it was awful. 
benefit of having a planner who was completely conversant with all aspects of the process and fully conversant with the provincial requirements was that we quickly found out that this was not normal procedure for the public input process. And that any council who saw this kind of turnout would investigate and send staff to redouble their efforts to engage the public so that more than 15 out of 3,700 residents got involved in the process. Everything council and staff do is supposed to be for the benefit of the residents and the community. Even when they are ordered by the province, as we are with the official growth plans, official plans and secondary plans, it has to be implemented in a way that includes the will of the public and be a benefit to the community. In fact, the provincial protocols on public consultation and the procedural bylaw that govern municipal action repeatedly speak of partnerships and the benefit to the residents and community. Yet repeatedly we are seeing senior staff abusing those protocols and councils not interceding strongly enough to defend those protocols on behalf of you and I, the public. How does this involve you, direct democracy, and why should you care? It involves you because we live in a small community, so everything that happens affects all of us. It involves you because when avoidable mistakes are made and lessons not learned, our money is wasted and our taxes go up. It involves direct democracy, which advocates the use of referendums to resolve the important decisions that affect all of us. Moreover, the process toward direct democracy reinvigorates the idea of a partnership. After all, councillors and staff train, drive the same roads we do, partake in the same activities and the same communities we live in. We are the same people living together, with the same interests at heart. Direct democracy will, I believe, resolve many of the issues of transparency and trust that have been severely tested of late. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to introduce John Snyder, of Snyder Auto, and he's going to bring you up to date on some of the Main Street uh, stuff that's going on. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Hello, so my name is John Snyder, as you've heard, and I'm here tonight as a member of Citizens for Direct Democracy. We are a small group of people working to bring meaningful changes to how this municipality is run. My focus tonight is to talk about the Main Street upgrade. For those of you who don't live here, I should tell you that Main Street connects Highway 36 to Market Square. It is a busy street and will become more so when the proposed subdivisions are built. For three years, uh, Steve Clark and myself have worked to try to open the eyes of the city and its engineers about their short-sightedness in the redesign of Main Street. We have argued about water and wastewater piping, about parking changes, and about sidewalk placement. We talked to an engineering firm about, about these things at the public consultation meeting. We talked to city engineers as well, but ideas and concerns fell on deaf ears. I would like to tell you some of the things that have and are ongoing through this upgrade. First, the new storm drain pipes were to start by the bridge at Main and Front. But the city failed to get a permit from the Trent Severn Waterway in time. This caused the project to stall as the construction company was forced to change plans so that in-ground excavation didn't start on Main Street at that location, but started at Main and Joseph. As the pipeline in the ground progressed, it became obvious that the new storm drain pipes would be too close to the surface, to the surface. So insulation had to be added in order to prevent freeze-up. Hopefully this will work as water and sanitary pipes for the east side properties either touch those new pipes or come very close to those drain pipes. Will freeze up be a problem? Second, parking. Originally allowed on both sides of Main Street. Now parking will only be on the west side, which means people will have to cross the street, especially for businesses that have no or limited parking, such as the Lions Hall, Dr. Blocks, and on and others, which will bring me to my third issue, the road grades or elevation. City engineers have given no good reason for a huge drop in elevation, especially as you approach Market Square. This drop now creates a problem for entering and exit from private property as you must drive or walk up the slopes. As winter sets in, how will the city cope with snow banks above sidewalks? As you know, our winters can be variable in temperature, so these banks of snow will melt. 
that meltwater will end up on the sidewalks, which will then refreeze, leaving icy walking conditions. To make things worse, some areas of the new road surface are super elevated. This means water or meltwater will have to flow across the street and uh, creating a chance of blocked ice in the winter. So this new streetscape will either have an icing problem or an increased maintenance cost through the winter. During construction, it became obvious that city engineers did not do their due diligence, as many changes in road elevation have occurred. Driveway entrances, some forgotten, some removed against property owners' wishes. Five or six hundred feet of new curb on the east side removed. Why? Because the west side curbs were installed too low. Apparently, it was cheaper to remove and replace the east side curbs and lower the road again. We talked to the engineers about the water and wastewater pipes. We were told, no, the pipes are not old enough to replace. Even though 51% of the water being processed for drinking is leaking into the ground, and you and I are paying for that. Myself, I talked to the construction manager. His hands are tied. He must do a city engineer's directive. I have talked to city engineers only to be talked in circles and then in the end ignored. No changes. I have had a site visit with the mayor himself where he told me it was too late for changes and we should have faith in the engineering department. Everything will be fine. These are changes we have asked for during the last three years. Water and wastewater upgrades. Put the sidewalk back where it was. Allow parking on both sides of the street. And talk to Enbridge Gas about pre-plumbing for natural gas. But as usual, no one listens. When water mains break or wastewater pipes become too small as Bob Cajun grows, who will pay to reopen Main Street and do the job that should be done now? Who will compensate the small business for the lost revenue as the job now runs into overtime? City engineers have promised the mayor there will be no problems as the road is engineered to municipal standards. They also promised the project will be on budget. But the site manager has said to me many extras have been incurred. Extra fill, new spacers for the drains as the original spacers were incorrect after all the changes in road elevation. I also recently learned that no engineer drawings were ever provided to the construction company, just verbal directions. These are some of the things going on during the Main Street update, and it is nowhere near completion. What will be the cost overrun? Will the city hide those facts from us? When will it be finished? How long will it be before it is torn up to replace the water and wastewater infrastructure? What will happen in winter? Will winter maintenance costs rise, or will we don ice skates? <laughs> Ultimately, the taxpayer will be on the hook for poor planning. Thank you for coming tonight and listening. We, the Citizens for Direct Democracy, hope to gain support through the municipality as we move closer to the next municipal election. We want to bring positive change and public involvement back to regain control over the city's future will be able to then avoid these unnecessary and expensive mistakes. Thanks. Our next speaker is Mr. Bill Holmes. He lives in Omimi, and he will provide us just some figures on staff salaries, which we think will probably make you very unhappy. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay, let's go here now. In, uh, I always do my stuff. It comes from the city. I know some people there and they send me stuff that maybe they shouldn't be sending. But anyway, when we started and we got amalgamated in, in uh, 2002, we had uh, debentures of $14 million and there's hundreds of thousands of dollars with that. And we have long-term bank loans of $6 million. And then if you come up to uh, 08, we come up to uh, 
it's in the ventures is only seven million, but our long-term bank loans are 33 million, and that brings us up to in, in 08 to 55 million dollars in debt. And now with the other guys were talking about uh, <clears throat> raises. Terry Jones, he's the platoon chief. In 11 and 12 of the year, he got a 62.72% raise. So he went from 108,000 to 175,000 in one year. And you take uh, Kevin, uh, Greg Chanks. He got, last year, he got a $9,000 raise. Now, who else gets that stuff like that there? And they have, they have all the raises. They go from 62, the lowest one is 17%. And he went from 105 to 124. So I don't see anybody here getting that kind of raises. And then we have uh, our uh, deputy, or John Haggerty, our fire chief here. In 016, he made $182,000. And then we have some other stuff here that uh, when we bought the trolley, I don't know which one bought the trolley, but it cost us $84,000. And that's not the shipping and get it fixed, which it don't run. So wow. they sold it to the school to the school in Lindsay for six thousand dollars. Now who ate the cost of that? We did. Now the general tax levy is uh, the principal closing is twenty four million four hundred and ninety eight thousand nine hundred and sixty five. You got the water and the sewer which there's only about forty thousand people pay for that. It's forty five million in debt. The trunk's 12 million in debt, but that they say that anybody that's buying a new house, they have to pay for it. Now, they're talking about Walmart coming. Walmart ain't gonna pay these things that pay. So if Walmart comes here, we're paying for Walmart. They're not paying that, or they wouldn't come here. Now, the gross city debt before it is 82,991,408. And you got a housing debt uh, fund eight and have fund nine. Now, our net municipal debt is $90,439,103. And we say we've got 73,000 people here, 7,000 of them are kids. They don't pay taxes. And now, we're going to break up the city. If we want to make a change to the city, all we have to do is vote in five councillors that want to get out of this. And if we get the five, we can overrun the city. We can take, we can shut the city down. We can go to Queens Park and get it reversed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Bill. Well, thank you for uh, sitting and listening so patiently. So now we've reached the fun part, the Q and A. So, are there any questions from the public? Yes, Don. I'm down to the last location. Is there nothing the province can do to rein in these clowns? Peter has been discussing with the province and the uh, Minister for Municipal <coughs> Housing and, uh, sorry, Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the sad tale. <coughs> uh, we had several letters to Bill Munro, who is the Minister, and uh, he kept sending it back and it really was getting nowhere. Then we sent a letter to his offshoot who is in uh, Kingston, I think, Chuckled Scott, he's the district uh, person. And we said to him that we would like to come and chat with you. We'd drive down to Kingston and we would chat with you and just discuss our problems and how we feel about things. And then he wrote back and fundamentally he said two things, no, I won't chat with you, and what you have to do is direct your inquiries to the city of Kawatha Lakes. Now, now, I have been through this process with government time after time. I, I did it when I was living on the lake and we were concerned about they wanted to put a boat slip into the water there on a very sensitive area. It's only about three or four feet deep. It's full of lily pads and toes and all the good things. And they wanted to put it in. And they got permission, and so I, I went to local people in, in uh, Peterborough, Trent Seven, from then up the chain, and right to the top dog, and that didn't work. And then, to the minister. 
the Minister of Heritage Canada, who was in charge of the whole system, who said, thank you very much for your letter, I refer it to the head. You, you, you get that with government again and again and again. They get you in this circular path, and I think, well, I was in the Ministry of Education, so I know this for a fact. No ministry will ever attack any other ministry. They will never haul them in. And that's exactly what you see. If you've been following the star with all their problems, the Brampton and Sons of War, the only resolution is to take court action. Because the minister is supposed to be, we, we have the same thing with the ombudsman. There's an ombudsman who's supposed to look into these things. And we sent them all the star. And we said, this is the problem. What are you going to do? Well, you know, well, well. We take them to advise them. And, and, and it, it's the same with, with the council itself. They have the same strategy. That <clears throat> the people in, in Port 32 were concerned about the cost of water. And so they wrote a petition, and we sent the petition off to the to council, and council sent back, yeah, thanks very much for the petition, etc., etc. Nothing happened. So I went and I actually spoke to them. And I had all the charts and so on the expenses. And, and I, I was quite rude to the mayor because at the end of this presentation, he said, we will give this to the staff for their input. They themselves don't deal with anything. And that was over a year ago, and we haven't heard anything back. And it, it's now a strategy. They said, we did the same thing with uh, Premier Wynn. We wrote a wrong, long ream because it's kind of interesting. I've got a book here by... Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff on this if you're really interested. Uh, it's called Gun in Toronto by Chapel Redway. I've actually spoken to him on the phone. And in here, you will find what happened in Toronto as they grouped all together Scarborough and all the other places. And Wynne was one of the biggest people against amalgamation. She used to hold meetings of 3,000 people. So she was anti all the way together with other politicians, because they could see it was a big scam by Harris. Fundamentally, it was a political scam by Harris. That's what it was all about. But so we wrote this letter and said, look, look, you, you were on our side. What, what's happened to you? Silence. Silence. Deadly silence. So, and Bill has, has said, what needs to be done? They're not going to help us. The only way is to get the right people on council, and then those people on council can write the bylaws to change the whole structure. They can push things out to the periphery, to the various municipalities, and well, do all kinds of stuff within the present framework. But we must have control. And that's why I said in my speech that it's, it's, that it's no good saying that these councillors can be changed, you know. If they were on our side, they would have already done stuff in council, but they are not. And everything I write goes to them, goes to the mayor, it goes to every councillor, it goes to all the press, it goes to Munro, minister, and, and to an MVP and a member of parliament. They all know exactly what is happening here, and they won't raise a single stick to tell. Not one. They're completely unworthy, so you have to take control. It's imperative that the next election we put people in place who believe that it is the people's will that they have to implement. Nothing else matters. There are other kind of you know, worrisome things, like you shouldn't really bring up. You're not recording anymore, are you? Yep. Oh, <laughs> I won't say anything. It, 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 it concerns the fact that, you know, the mayor of the, the town hall meeting said there have been 30, uh, no, 15 new developments in the city, 13 of them in Lindsay. Yeah. Now, now, it, we know everything's being concentrated in Lindsay. Lindsay is going to become bigger and bigger, more powerful, more and more people. Visitors will come there. You know, basketball teams will come there. People will come to Lindsay. And who will make a profit out? The people who've got restaurants and the people who are building hotels. With that, I will leave you. Because we know who's building hotels. Uh, yeah, and another little <coughs> issue that uh, highlights the way the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the city work together is over the Bob Cajun secondary plan because <coughs> as soon as this process ended and the uh, council approved the secondary plans, um, there was about, I think, 15 appellants of the OMB immediately 
but one of them was the Ministry of Housing, uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, okay, and they were forcing the city to try and make all the changes that the other appellants were trying to make, and the city basically dug its heels in, bought, uh, we got to the point of having an OMB meeting, which cost, I think, $124,000 to put on this meeting. The judge showed up, uh, the meeting lasted an hour and a half, and she just packed up her stuff and walked out and said, this is absolutely ridiculous. So what had happened was, last November, the ministry ordered the City Court of Lakes to go back to the beginning with the public process of input. Uh, I got wind of this, I immediately contacted them. Uh, they did no such thing, and May the 30th, I believe, they passed the, okay, all, in fact, all the secondary plans and the official plan. <coughs> and um, so everyone's going back to the OMB, which is a huge cost for the city. Uh, it's a huge in, in, in interference in the plan. But I mean, the ministry didn't even step in and say, hey, no, no, you've got to go to the public. They had the, the council meeting was at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Nobody could attend. And they're going to deal with five plans in three hours. I mean, there was just no room for public comment. So the ministry has this sort of schizophrenic approach to, yeah, we're forcing them to do it through the OMB, but they were not following up to make sure that they go through with what we've asked them to do. And as Peter said, we contacted them to uh, talk about the follow-up, and uh, they just weren't interested at all. So is there any other questions? John? I just wanted to make a, an announcement for those who may have attended the um, any of the town hall meetings, Steve and I, and, and Peter did, and one up one down in Valencia. The mayor had talked about uh, borrowing an additional $40 million to hold as a kind of a cushion. Well, I believe there was a news release today saying that $25 million has been secured. We are now another $25 million in debt as of today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've been to see Laurie Scott numerous times. And Laurie Scott told us, I have a letter known from her, her sign, that we can go $200 million in debt at 4% and we're fine. Now, to service the debt we're at now, when the mayor has finished his four years, he's give the bank $40 million. If he gets in again, that's $80 million that he's given of our taxpayer money. <laughs> And that's that's don't pay nothing. That's that just the interest. interest. That's just interest. That, that hasn't touched the debt whatsoever. Yeah. Right. And that's just on the long term bank. Yeah. That's not the debentures because Tuesday they signed uh, twenty six thousand dollars for debentures. Oh, another. Yes. Oh, and you people can read all that. It's all on the website. Yeah. Anyways, we're trying to do something here. We're trying to you know make people knowledgeable about the place they live in and get people involved because. We think it's a serious concern. We think that things need to change, and uh, we, we'd like some help. So. Uh, yeah, and, and of course, you know, when there's just three of us standing here, uh, pounding at the council, you, they just think we're lightweights, yeah. because we just don't have the weight of numbers. So uh, what we'd like to do, actually, to get you help, there is a sign-in sheet here. If you could leave your email addresses, and uh, we could just keep you up to date with what's going on, and uh, talk about it. That's so anybody the, who wants to get involved? That's probably the biggest can thing I, that we can, can do I, is reconnect with the community. You know, we were just talking earlier, when I first came to Bob Cajun, you know, the four of the uh, the firefighting uh, fundraisers to, to build the fire or to add a hover crown, uh, we, we, we talked as a community, we had a whole discussion as to how we were going to spend the four foot memorial money. And the whole village was included. The hydro money, when the hydro was sold, we engaged as a community. And um, we need to get back to that because what we don't see is that these things, I think, I think one of the problems that the council has run into is they've run into professional civil servants. Okay? And these are empire builders, they are slick operators, they know how to move slice by slice. And that's why when you phone the Bob Cajun Service Center, you have to phone Lindsay now and you redirect to Bob Cajun. This is one of these subtle, these one little subtle move and a myriad of subtle moves that shift the power from one side to the other. And you don't even realize it's happening until one day, wait a minute, we don't, we don't have a service center. It's all, when did it go? 
And we didn't notice because it happened shaving by shaving, slice by slice. And so that's why we're trying to raise awareness and hopefully we can get some, some of you to talk about this openly and, and start uh, you know, engaging not just your MPP but your local councillor and actually asking those hard questions and not letting them fob you off like Andy did. Uh, you know, when you ask him a question, and you don't like it, just leave. And then carry on with the discussion. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's getting pretty, pretty in your face, isn't it? And a lot of things that uh, people don't really watch is the sunshine, the sunshine list that comes in once a year. People don't realize that when they started an amalgamation, we had, I believe it was six or seven people on that list. Two years ago, it was seven. We had, we had zero. Okay. But two years ago we had 74, and last year we had 86, and the numbers are growing in the sunshine list. Of course, people make more than 100,000. We have 108. See? 108. Yeah, and yeah average, we're cutting services. Their average salary, if you work them all out, is 113,000 or is $13,000 a month. Yeah. That's what we're paying all these people to the sunshine club. Yeah. 108. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's we're what's cutting going fireballs, yeah. and we're cutting. Community centers and all the important things that people want, they're cutting. But nobody is looking at the huge trough and the pigs there gorging there. <laughs> and this, no uh, the, it's right, right here on our leaflet that there's 108. Um, 108 senior employees cost us 12 million. There was a 5,400% increase from just before amalgamation. And people think we made up this one. No, that's taken right from the government webpage. That, that very graph is right on the government webpage. Yeah. But can I have a little say? Sure. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that people get browbeaten into thinking that, you know, if we let the people rule themselves, that uh, you, you won't get very good government, that these experts out there. Uh, you know, are the ones, and we must count out them. And you hear the councillors saying that all the time. They say, "Well, staff says we should do this, so they do it." But the fact of the matter is that the only form of government which is mathematically correct is direct democracy. It has a long history because the, in statistics, what you find is that when you take a whole lot of people, this is the average of the people, and this is right. And uh, it started in 18, about 1820, a, a chap called Sir Francis Galton, he went to a fair in England, and one of the prizes was if you could guess the weight of an oxen. So all the people there, they wrote them things. At the end of it, at the end of it, when they weighed the oxen and somebody won the prize, he took all those slips of paper and he ranked them in order. And lo and behold, the middle value, the median, was very close to the weight of the oxen. Okay? But when he took the average, he was dead on. He was better than everybody there, even the experts who actually, you know, kept cattle. And from that, we get a thing called the wisdom of crowds. It's, it's a scientific uh, theory. And this is just full and full of examples of it. And if I just read the back, it says, large groups, and by large groups, that would be a decision made by us all collectively on something about how much we are prepared to pay in taxes, or what parks we are prepared to close. When we make that decision, they are smarter than an elite few. No matter how brilliant they are, we are better at solving problems, fostering innovation, coming to wise decisions, even predicting the future. And it's called the wisdom of crowds. Now what is kind of interesting is this, is that's been taken further. My, my grandson is doing his master's course, and from this, which is kind of really simple statistics, you can now take huge, huge data banks. But it's the same thinking. If you get enough data, when you get to the middle, by God, you got it right. No matter what anybody else thinks, well, it doesn't matter. And, and I always find that it's all very humbling because I've been fairly well educated, and I keep thinking that probably I'm a bit smarter than most people. But I say, in, in in the role of humanity, of how we live together, I'm not. I'm not. But collectively, we're super. So 
So that, that's what's behind this. We will make excellent decisions, like in Switzerland. You never hear of riots in Switzerland. You never hear of, of people going out on the streets of banners. No. Because before the government passes a law, they know what the people wanted. It's so easy to leave. Uh, I don't understand it. I just don't understand, councillors. Why is it so hard to do what the people want? Why is it so hard? Money. Money? You make the right go. You get, you get guys on there that will tell you that we want to get out of this here. As soon as they get the first paycheck, boy, this is a great place to be. Yeah. They get everything for free. Yeah. Yeah, the mayor's getting, what, 80, 70, 85,000 a year now. Yeah. For a part-time job. Yeah. And he let, lets all those clowns do the work for him. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that, that's the, another thing which you, you, you'll find in, I mean, I, I do a lot of reading because I'm interested, but this is uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And um, one of the things I identified, when Rome became very, very powerful, the big Romans, they, they brought in Greek slaves. And the Greek slaves got to the stage where they were making the decisions. And that was the beginning of the decline of Rome. And it's exactly the same here. We have all these councillors, and they let everybody else make the decisions. We can't. If you're a councillor, you've got to make the decisions. You've got to answer to the people. Yeah, so, that's when they signed that yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. That's okay. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to add is, um, usually when you talk about direct democracy and, and referendums and the like, the first thing that comes up is, I believe it's Proposition, Proposition 7 in California, uh, they put a ballot on the, uh, sorry, a question on the ballot, uh, should we cut property taxes? Again, of course, everyone said yes. Well, the next thing that happened was there was nothing to pay for the sewer, the upgrades of the roads, all the things that you need to run something. They even got um, private communities worked out a deal uh, with the municipality that they uh, they would take care of their own roads and services so that they wouldn't have to pay taxes. And this is the wrong way to present a referendum. And how they do it in Switzerland is uh, actually, I think, says, um, was it 2%, 3% of the population can bring a question to government for referendum. And once that happens, once a referendum is triggered, uh, information packed.